Eugenics research. Eugenics research is like science's awkward cousin, who always gets skipped in the family reunion because he has a dark and weird history. And if he did show up, he'd probably lecture everyone about improving the gene pool. Eugenics is the pseudoscientific idea that humans could improve their species by controlling who gets to reproduce. This might sound like the plot of a dystopian novel, but it was disturbingly real. Beginning in the late 19th century, eugenicists believed they could weed out undesirable traits, such as diseases, disabilities, or traits traits they deemed socially unfit, and promote desirable ones. Think of it as a matchmaking app. But instead of swiping left, they sterilized people. In theory, it sounds like selective gardening. But in practice, there was nothing moral about pruning or cutting out people who had undesirable traits. You're not six foot tall? Well, you're not fit to reproduce. At one point, the US even believed in eugenics when they thought that people with IQs lower than average weren't supposed to breed. However, this was particularly popular during the Nazi Germany era, as the Germans believed they could create the perfect Aryan race by practicing eugenics. Their research fueled sterilization programs, targeting marginalized groups, including people with disabilities, immigrants, and racial minorities. This solidified eugenics as the scientific equivalent of Voldemort, something society decided we don't even name anymore. The dark history and lack of moral compass associated with eugenics is one of the reasons why it's widely banned. On top of that, its foundations are scientifically flawed, because there is no clear-cut standard for what's desirable and un undesirable. One person's perfect human might be another person's trash human. Alfred Kinsey's research. Alfred Kinsey was essentially the first scientist who told an entire generation of scientists that he wanted to talk about There's nothing wrong about that today, but he did that during the 40s and 50s, when was best kept in the bedroom and out of scientific labs. Kinsey's works led to the famous Kinsey reports, which included two books behavior in the human male and sexual behavior in the human female. These reports were like the scientific version of throwing a live grenade into 1950s societal norms, because no one wanted to talk about back then. This guy was one of the first researchers to take a systematic scientific approach to studying human sexual behavior. Instead of relying on assumptions or Sunday sermons, he collected thousands of interviews about people lives. Imagine your nosy neighbor asking you personal questions, like how often you had your fantasies, and what counts as normal. Sounds innocent enough at first, but his methods included interviews with marginalized populations, including workers and incarcerated individuals. Some of his data also came from pedophiles, recounting their experiences with children, which understandably raised enormous ethical concerns. Kinsey argued he needed to explore every corner of human behavior to complete the picture, but for many, that picture looked less like art and more like a crime scene. Adding fuel to the fire, Kinsey's findings revealed that practices were far more diverse than society admitted. The reports showed high percentages of behaviors, like premarital homo and extramarital affairs. These findings shocked people that were used to thinking everyone lived like they were in a black and white sitcom. The backlash was intense. Religious groups and conservative politicians accused Kinsey of corrupting public morals, and some even labeled his work as pornography disguised as science. Over time, his funding dried up and his work got banned, not because they talked about but more because they crossed certain lines that shouldn't be crossed. Human-animal hybrids For decades, researchers have dabbled with the idea of mixing human cells with animal ones, mainly in the name of medicine. Imagine if we could grow a pig liver compatible for transplant into humans, or think of cows with human blood types to study diseases. It sounds like something out of a mad scientist's journal, but the truth is, the real focus has been on life-saving, or at least life-improving, experiments. However, ethical alarm bells start ringing whenever you mention blending humans and animals, the chimeras, combinations between humans and animals that scientists have created are not exactly mythological beasts, but more like laboratory hybrids. Researchers have tried inserting human cells into animal embryos, typically pigs or mice, to grow human tissues within a different species. But this practice is heavily regulated, or outright banned in many places, due to the ethical tightrope it walks. There's fear that human-animal hybrids could develop too much human-like cognition or consciousness. Imagine a mouse pondering life's mystery Mysteries, or worse, plotting a lab escape. On top of that, hybrids challenge our moral boundaries. Can we call a pig with human cells a human? Or is it safe to turn it into bacon without making you look like a cannibal eating another human? No one knows where to draw the line. There's a creepy concern that we could end up in a Planet of the Apes situation. But instead of apes, it's cows revolting, because they don't want to be turned into gourmet steak meals. The point is, while these experiments hold medical potential, society still has a foot firmly planted on the brakes. Hybrids might one day help grow organs or cure diseases, 
is, but for now, that family reunion with feathered cousins will stay safely in science fiction. Human Head Transplants Let's say you have a faulty body, but a perfectly working head. The only way for you to live a normal life is to have a head transplant. It's kind of like sewing an old doll's head on a new body to give it new life. When applied to humans, it sounds like a good way of curing bad medical conditions, but there's a reason why the science behind it might be a bit too heady. As if the guy who thought of it had his head high on the clouds. At first, you'd think transplanting a human head to a new body is as easy and simple as transferring a new engine to an old car. But there's a reason why it's not a well-accepted scientific finding. The first attempts at head transplants date back to the 1950s. Russian scientist Vladimir Demikov was one of the pioneers, but his experiments were mainly on dogs and monkeys. He transplanted dog heads onto other dogs, but neither the head nor the body could survive for long. Let's just say it was a real rough time for those dogs, as they didn't quite get the heads up they needed to survive. Fast forward a few decades, and Italian neurosurgeon Sergio Canavero stirred up the conversation in 2015. He proposed that it might be possible to transplant a human head onto a donor body with the right technology. The idea was to give people with severe paralysis or degenerative diseases a new shot at life. But perhaps he glossed over a critical detail from biology class. The body and brain aren't so keen on being split up, as they're connected on more than just a physical level. The real issue, however, is that the human spinal cord isn't your average bundle of wires. It's the nerve center of the whole system, and once you sever it, there's no simple plug-and-play fix. Instead, it's more like cutting through a highway of microscopic one-way streets, each with its own crucial role. Reconnecting the brain to a different body could lead to the ultimate case of ghosting, with the head and body refusing to talk to each other. Canavero's dream has stirred plenty of controversy, but no one has tried a full human head transplant. Many countries have banned it, partly because it's dangerous, but mostly because it makes you question things like identity, consent, and the very nature of humanity. LSD as a psychiatric treatment. Nothing represents the hippie culture more than LSD, scientifically known as lysergic acid diethylamide. While this is often considered a dangerous drug, some scientists were genuinely curious why hippies were always chill and talking about peace and stuff, instead of getting bothered by the affairs of society. That's why doctors and researchers were tripping on the idea that LSD could revolutionize mental health treatments. They thought LSD might help patients by inducing a sort of controlled, mystical experience. The theory was that it could provide deep insights, like shining a psychedelic flashlight into the shadowy corners of the subconscious. Think of it as Freudian analysis, but with neon lights and kaleidoscopic visuals. LSD was studied for treating everything from depression to alcoholism. In fact, one study reported that it helped alcoholics achieve sobriety, with success rates better than traditional methods at the time. The logic was that LSD could break down the ego and open the mind to new ways of thinking. It was like rehab with rainbows and existential breakthroughs. But when LSD found its way to counterculture and using it for recreational purposes, there were concerns over safety and abuse. There were stories of bad trips and psychotic breaks that caused reckless behavior. Basically, it turned into a game of mental roulette, where people were either chill or ready to freak out. So by the 60s, the government classified LSD as a Schedule One drug with no accepted medical use and high potential for abuse. Basically, the research about its psychiatry benefits was banned. Despite the ban, some scientists are trying to cautiously revisit LSD in treating PTSD, depression, and anxiety. It's like the 1960s research is getting a second trip, but without the hippie drama. Cloning. You're at work and your boss tells you to do many tasks that not only take up your entire day, but require you to hop from one spot to another in a hurry. It's like you need to have different copies of yourself to finish everything on your to-do list. Then you wish cloning machines were real so that you can just make multiple copies of yourself. But there's a reason why this tech is essentially banned for humans, making it impossible for you to be in multiple places at once. Cloning is essentially like a biological copy and paste. Scientists use the DNA from one organism to create an exact genetic replica. Back in the 1990s, scientists made history by cloning a sheep named Dolly. Here's how they did it. They took the control center, called a nucleus, from one sheep's cell and popped it into an egg cell that had its own control center taken out. The egg started growing, and eventually, out came Dolly, a sheep that was a perfect copy of the first one. As if they placed the original sheep in a photocopying machine and reproduced a second copy. However, the cloning of humans is where science screeched to a halt, like someone pulled the emergency brake. 
The ethical, legal, and technical issues surrounding human cloning are a tangled mess. On a practical level, cloning isn't always effective. Dolly was one out of 277 attempts, and even she had health issues, which led to her premature death. For humans, this high failure rate would be devastating. Imagine hundreds of copies of yourself dying before they create a single healthy copy of you. Then there's the ethical side. Some people say cloning is playing God, like trying to use cheat codes to create life. The potential misuse of cloning, like cloning humans for spare organs or trying to recreate lost loved ones, raises big moral questions. Critics fear a world where clones are seen as less human or treated like disposable extras instead of unique individuals. Weaponizing pathogens Let's say you're coughing and sneezing. That sounds like a normal day of the sniffles, and you think it's just because of your allergies. Or maybe you caught a light flu from someone on the train. But as you go about your day, you start coughing blood and sneezing your brains out. It's not just a simple cold, but has already become a deadly virus, as you see everyone around you dropping dead. That's the possibility of a weaponized pathogen. With a few tweaks here and there, pathogens can go from regular minor problems to supervillain level threats. And it's about as bad as it sounds, because it's like giving a cold virus a gym membership and a vendetta. The concept of weaponizing pathogens has existed since the early 20th century, proving that humans never miss a chance to make a bad idea worse. During World War II, both the Allies and the Axis powers were eyeing biological warfare like it was the next big thing, until they realized that unleashing killer microbes could backfire spectacularly. After all, diseases aren't known for their loyalty. Once they're out there, they don't discriminate on who they take down. Bacteria like anthrax or viruses like smallpox don't come with a remote control. You launch one of these, and it's liable to come back and cause a mess you can't scrub away. It's not just the target population that's in trouble. Once it mutates, the whole world might end up on its hit list. These days, most countries have agreed, via treaties like the Biological Weapons Convention, that creating biological weapons is a no-go. But there's always that one rogue nation or terrorist group that doesn't know the meaning of rules. We on this channel are working on weaponizing a pathogen called Subscribonitis. Once you catch it, you're going to subscribe to our channel and pass the virus to another person, who would also subscribe to our channel. Dissecting Psychopath Brains for Evil Genes Let's say you're a scientist and you've watched one too many Netflix documentaries on serial killers. Naturally, you start wondering if something ticking in the brain must be driving these folks to commit unspeakable acts. So you decide to open a few brains, study them, and hunt for the evil gene. It turns out you're not alone in this curiosity. Researchers, such as James Fallon, have long been on the lookout for abnormalities in brain structures like the amygdala and prefrontal cortex. These are the zones associated with emotion regulation and decision making. Differences here could help explain traits like lack of empathy or impulsivity, often linked to psychopathy. But just imagine the brain taking a little vacation and deciding empathy is optional. It'd be like your GPS switching off halfway through a long drive. The idea was that if we could pinpoint specific genes or brain patterns linked to these behaviors, we might better understand and maybe even predict or treat psychopathic tendencies. However, labeling a gene as the evil gene is oversimplifying and a bit misleading. Human behavior is complex, influenced by a mix of genetics, environment, upbringing, and personal experiences. Blaming the evil gene for evil acts is like saying you're evil because you were born this way. So when you're slicing up brains to locate that evil gene, things get tricky. There's a fear that tagging certain genes as evil could lead to some pretty unfair discrimination, or at least give people with those genes an excuse to go rogue. Imagine being told you're genetically predisposed to stealing cookies from the jar. It's as if they're setting up some of us to fail right out of the genetic gate. While the quest to map out psychopathy's biological roots continues, the scientific community is careful about staying ethical. Researchers are leaning more toward non-invasive methods like MRI scans and taking care in how they present their findings to avoid accidentally creating a supervillain by giving a person the idea that they're born evil. Heliocentrism. Let's say you get transported back to the 1500s. You know the center of the solar system is the sun because this has already been proven. So you might think you're about to impress people with your cutting-edge knowledge. Unfortunately, to the church of that time, you just became public enemy number one. As soon as you start talking about the solar system, they're eyeing you like you suggested Earth is just a simple floating rock. And so, with one quick sentence about the sun being the center of the solar system, you're suddenly branded a heretic who needs to get toasted on the stake. The heliocentric theory that the Earth wasn't the center of the cosmos was proposed by Nicholas Copernicus. Today, it seems obvious that we are not the superstars of the universe. Still, back then, this was mind-blowing, like saying the Earth isn't even a supporting actor, but just another background character in the cosmic movie. For people who thought they were center stage, this news hit hard. The
The theory didn't just mess with scientific minds, but hit the heart of religious beliefs. The church had taught that humans, and therefore Earth, were God's special little VIPs. They saw heliocentrism as a slippery slope that would lead people to question everything. The sun may rise, but according to them, this idea should be sent to bed and put to sleep because it didn't fit their beliefs. As heliocentrism gained momentum, the Catholic Church decided it was time to pump the brakes on this blasphemous theory. In 1616, they banned Copernicus's book on the revolutions of the celestial spheres, giving it the ancient version of a one-star review. The clampdown didn't end with Copernicus. Scientists like Galileo, who openly supported heliocentrism with his telescope-backed findings, faced the wrath of the Inquisition. In 1633, Galileo was tried, convicted, and sentenced to a staycation under house arrest for the rest of his life. Thank you.